Hi, welcome everyone to our um, virtual panel. Um, my name is uh, Sue Lana. I'm one of the medical oncologists here at the Flint Animal Cancer Center and I help coordinate our clinical services. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, exploring the clinical trials process and we title this webinar From the Lab to the Labrador. Um, I'll have our panelists introduce themselves in a minute. Uh, just to kind of go over what our format is today, um, we ask you to please be sure to remain muted during the panel. Um, it helps us not have a lot of feedback up here. And then if you're comfortable, please feel free to um, uh, share your video with us so we can see your faces. That would be awesome since you can see ours. I'd also like to tell you that um, uh, for our COVID protocols, um, we don't have masks on today um, up here, so you can see our faces, but everyone else in the room, our support uh, folks have masks, and we're all um, six feet apart, and we all get screened um, frequently for COVID, so we feel pretty comfortable today. Um, if our panelists want to introduce themselves, Dr. Tham, do you want to go first? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Lana. I'm uh, Doug Tham. I'm also a medical oncologist here at the Flint Animal Cancer Center. Uh, and I'm the Director of Clinical Research. Hi, I'm Kristen Weishar. I'm also a medical oncologist, and I am the Director of the Clinical Trials Program here at CSU. Hi there, I'm Jenna Burton, also one of the medical oncologists here and uh, the former Director of the Clinical mm -hmm. Trials Program. So um, our format for today, we're going to have our panelists speak on a variety of topics. Um, and then we will be answering the questions that were submitted uh, through the chat or, or prior to our um, panel. And then if we have time, we'll pick up any additional questions that are in the chat. If uh, we don't get to your question before our hour is over, uh, we'll follow up with individual people later on um, in the, the coming days. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Weissar, do you wanna kick us off and? describe our clinical trials program here at the Cancer Center? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, um, thanks everyone for joining us today. It's really great to have such a great audience. Um, so just a little bit about our clinical trials program. The overarching goal of clinical trials at CSU is to improve the care that we're able to provide for our patients diagnosed with cancer. And that includes both pets with cancer as well as people with cancer. And the way that we do this is by enrolling client-owned pets. So these are people's pets that have been diagnosed with cancer. We're not inducing cancer in any of these pets. It's a spontaneous diagnosis. Enrolling them into clinical studies where we're trying to find new ways and better ways to diagnose and treat these diseases. We learn something from every patient that's enrolled into a clinical trial, and we use that information to help treat other pets and people down the road. Uh, we have a really awesome team for our clinical trial service. So I am the uh, director of the clinical trial service, which means that I oversee everything that goes on with a daily basis with the clinical trial service. So I oversee all the patient care um, and help the doctors to make decisions about their tr trials patients. But then I also help sort of on the back end of the clinical trials. So if there's an investigator who wants to start a new clinical trial, I will help them to get everything set up so that we're able to collect the information that we need and get all the data that we, that we can in order to be able to use this information um, to help our clinical trials. We also have two clinical trials technicians and they are involved mostly in the patient care side of things. So that means um, talking to owners, taking in the patients when they come in for their appointments, helping out with sample collection, um, blood collection, urine collection, things like that, um, administering any treatments that are associated with the trials, and then also um, client communication about their pets. We also have a clinical trials coordinator, and his job is mostly to make sure that we're following everything that we're supposed to and doing everything correctly according to the study protocol. And he also helps out with processing all the samples for the clinical trials. Um, and then last, we have a clinical trials intern, which is a yearly position that we get a new person in every year. And their responsibility is to help out seeing all the cases that come in through clinical trials, and then also with recruiting patients for the trials. Um, in general, we have a very busy clinical trial service. It's been a little bit slower this past year because of COVID, obviously. 
Um, but for the most part, um, you know, we are really busy, have a good number of clinical trials going on at one time and are um, continuously enrolling and treating patients. So just to give you an idea, in 2019, we had a total of 35 clinical trials available for enrollment throughout the year, and we enrolled 120 patients into these clinical trials. Um, we see appointments sort of separately through the clinical trial service for patients that are coming in for their clinical trials. And we saw 956 appointments and a total of 167 patients. So definitely have a, a robust and busy program. As far as funding for the clinical trials, um, there's a, a, a variety of sources where we get the funding. Um, there are some trials that are sponsored internally, so from grants that come out of Colorado State University. There are also grants from private foundations, so like the Morris Animal Foundation, the American Kettle Club that we can apply for that can provide funding. There's also funding from industry sources, so like pharmaceutical companies, and also from government agencies like the National Institutes of Health. Great, thank you so much. Um, the next uh, kind of question is for Dr. Burton. Uh, can you comment on the importance of clinical trials for us in veterinary medicine and maybe human medicine too? Yeah, thanks Dr. Liana, happy to do so. Um, when I think about clinical, the clinical trials that we have ongoing on in the oncology group, um, I think there's kind of two big focuses. And so one focus is clinical trials that are really designed to find new treatments uh, or diagnostic tools to help our pets specifically with cancer. And then the other type of trial that we have is um, can, our, can our pets help us find better treatments or give us information about how to better treat uh, cancer in, uh, in people? And so when I think about the first type of trial, the really veterinary specific trials, you know, these are the gold standard that we have for investigating new therapies. And um, the benefit of these trials is that we enroll and evaluate patients in a really systematic manner. And so um, the studies are designed so that there are certain criteria to look at various study endpoints, tumor progression or tumor response. Um, and I think really importantly for owners, also looking at side effects and so proactively tracking side effects that we may expect with certain therapies, but also doing it in a manner where we don't miss maybe unlikely side effects that we didn't anticipate um, that could be really important to know about for the patients. Um, but our pets can also help people as well. And so there's a lot of overlap and similarities between some of the cancers that we see every day in, in dogs and cats and some of the cancers that occur, occur in people. And um, when investigators are studying new cancer therapies for people, there's a lot of different models that they may employ to try to figure out how well a new therapy might work prior to giving it to a person. Um, and so often they'll use cell culture, so cells grown up in a Petri dish. Um, they may use rodent models. Um, as they move things along, they may use larger animal models. And, um, and our companion animals, our pets, can actually be a really nice potential model for people as well. And I think some of the advantages, there's no perfect model, but I think some of the advantages our pets may have over the other models is that uh, they have cancers that arise spontaneously, and so they are um, heterogeneous tumors, and they have, you know, each tumor in a, in a dog, we may call it the same thing, we may call it a mast cell tumor, but there's variations that, that are going to occur within that tumor between dogs. Um, tumors also aren't just a bag of cancer cells, so there's a bunch of other things that, that we find in tumors um, that we kind of call the tumor microenvironment. And so um, supportive um, cells that support the tumor and help it grow and proliferate, immune cells that may um, dampen the body's ability to identify and attack, attack the cancer. These are all present in these naturally arising uh, tumors as well. So it really is a nice replication of, of what's happening in people as well compared to what we can artificially generate in the lab. Um, dogs and cats are, are bigger animals than our rodents and so um, you know, the, the, dose, the dosing that we use is probably a lot closer to what we would use in people. And I think one of the great things about incorporating um, our pets into some of these clinical trials, um, into these comparative oncology trials, is that we can gain a lot more information about potential side effects. So these are animals that are living at home with their owners. Um, 
being looked after day in and day out by their, their caregivers who are really attentive and can let us know the subtle side effects that they may be seeing that, that may be affecting their pet while on this trial. So we can get a lot more def, um, detailed information in that regard. Um, I think one of the, um, one of the other benefits, um, how our pets can help people, is that there are some tumors that we see um, with a lot, more a lot greater frequency than they do in people. And so I think a great example of that is bone cancer, or osteosarcoma. Um, that's a rare cancer in kids and young adults, um, but it's a pretty darn common cancer. And we, we probably see a, a new case every day or every other day in the clinic. Um, and so because we're seeing tumors like that so much more frequently, that can allow us to accrue patients to these clinical trials a lot more rapidly. Um, these dogs with bone cancer also unfortunately have a much shorter um, kind of longevity with their disease. Their disease progresses quickly despite the fact that a lot of the treatments are the same. So we have the potential to learn information a lot more quickly in dogs with osteosarcoma and accomplish some preliminary studies that could go on and, and help um, human patients with osteosarcoma as well. Are there any tumors in um, cats that you think might fit that bill? Um, well, cats are always a little bit more tricky. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, I think a great one in cats is, um, it's not a great tumor, um, but oral squamous cell carcinoma um, likely has a lot of overlap with um, some head and neck tumors in people as well. Um, so I think that's a, a nice tumor type. Oh, I did think of one more benefit, if I can mm -hmm. throw that in. Um, so when we, when we have these comparative oncology trials uh, where we're maybe looking at a new therapy that's ultimately designated hopefully for people, but we're um, including evaluation of our pets in that therapy, um, there have been occasions where we found that the drug doesn't really pan out for people, but we've included our, our, our dogs in, in these early studies. And so there's been examples where those drugs have then be, been repurposed for a veterinary indication. And so now we've got a new drug um, at our disposal to, to treat cancer in our dogs. So it kind of goes full circle in, in how, it, um, how our dogs can benefit people and how these same trials can ultimately benefit dogs too. Great, thank you. Um, next one is for Dr. Tham. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you decide what to study, kind of what the process is, how we go from an idea to a clinical trial and, and what goes into that? Sure. Um, so in my role as the, the director of clinical research, one of the things that I, that I serve as is kind of uh, the point of first contact for any sort of external um, collaborators or potential sponsors who might be interested in pursuing um, research again um, that involves uh, the treatment or the diagnosis of our, uh, uh, of our clientele, our pets with cancer. And, um, you know, usually the very first step is just to have a preliminary con conversation and, and sort of get a gauge for how much they understand what we do and no, these are not laboratory animals and no, we're not giving them cancer and these are people's pets. And um, the fact that this, these, aren't, uh, um, these studies aren't free, um, we do need some way to support the, uh, the cost um, that are associated with these studies. And then there's certainly a level of scientific scrutiny that occurs as well. So um, do, do we feel like the, the, the kind of uh, um, work that they're proposing is something that makes sense scientifically? Do they have preliminary data that would um, support moving directly into people's pets? Do we need to take a step back and say, well, maybe what we really ought to do is take a look in a Petri dish first, or let's make sure that um, this seems like it's been a, a treatment that's been well tolerated in some other laboratory species, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, if we get to that point, you know, this, this seems to make sense, this seems like something that, that might be worth checking out, then my next job is generally to try and identify somebody at the Flint Animal Cancer Center who I think might be an appropriate person to sort of spearhead the efforts from our side. And um, sometimes that's me, but quite often it may not be. So for example, if this is um, a novel diagnostic tool, perhaps it might be something that's better suited to one of our, um, our, our imaging specialists or one of our pathologists. If this is something that involves a new uh, a surgical device, 
Um, I'm far from a surgeon, so we would certainly have one of our surgery specialists potentially um, get involved there. And of course, this is always voluntary, right? So um, we'll often try to sort of um, introduce them to the idea, let them pick up and have some discussions with the potential collaborator. Um, and again, under no obligation then, if they decide that they do want to work together, they can sort of take it from there. Once we kind of have gotten to the point where, yep, this, this seems like it's something that might be worth considering, generally what we start with is a very, very short, what we call a scope of work. So a one or two page little outline about how we think the, the, uh, the study might be designed so that we can answer the questions that, uh, that our collaborators are interested in answering. Um, and then that kind of gets bashed back and forth between us and the collaborator a few times. And then once we kind of feel like we say, okay, this, this seems like something that's pretty reasonable, um, maybe we can go ahead and, and move forward with that. We'll generally um, generate a more, what we call a formal protocol. And this is generally a you know, 20 or 30 page document that, that sort of details very specifically, well, what kind of patients are gonna be enrolled and um, uh, you know, how healthy do they have to be and can they have been pretreated or not? And what's gonna happen on every single visit when they come in? And, um, and that really sort of serves as a template. So um, as Kristen mentioned earlier, the clinical trials team can actually look at this and say, okay, I understand exactly what's gonna happen when to these patients and we're all on the same page and we're all gonna be doing it exactly the way that, that, that it needs to be done. Now, um, that's not usually the end of the story. So there are a few regulatory hoops that we need to jump through um, and I don't say that lightly, they're very appropriate, uh, before we can just say, okay, that sounds great, let's start treating people's pets. Um, there, there are two different levels of, of um, sort of oversight that our trials have, and one of them is through what's called um, the Colorado State University Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. So this is a committee that generally is responsible for um, oversight of um, uh, studies that are done with research animals, so with laboratory animals, but they'll sometimes also get involved in studies that use client-owned animals, or again, uh, patients that are presenting to the veterinary teaching hospital. Um, but they also sort of do serve as the sort of um, line of first defense. So they'll take a look at, at what we're proposing and say, yep, I think we ought to sort of give you formal approval for this. Or, eh, you know, this one is probably one where you can simply get oversight from the other group, which is a group that's actually housed at our veterinary teaching hospital called the Clinical Review Board. And that's actually um, something that, uh, that Dr. Burton is uh, a member of that, uh, again, is, is really in place to review the protocols that are submitted and make sure that the safety of the animals is, is um, being preserved and that the studies are scientifically justified. And then periodically, um, either or both of those groups will sometimes sort of check up on how things are going as the study is moving along, making sure that there haven't been any problems or issues that need to be addressed et cetera, making sure that, um, we're not, uh, that we're treating the number of patients we said we were gonna treat and all those kinds of things. And with all that information in place, we're then able to sort of pull the trigger on a new study um, down in our clinic. So that's generally the way the, the pathway works for an external um, kind of collaborator. Uh, but as Kristen mentioned, we can sometimes do studies that involve an idea that somebody here at the Animal Cancer Center has come up with in which case, again, obviously those steps of finding the right investigator and those sorts of things can be skipped. We also do these multi-institutional trials with organizations um, that are sort of at a national level. Um, and again, those um, are slightly different, but the pathway of, of approval is the same. So we may already have a protocol established. We still need to get the same levels of approval from the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee or the Clinical Review Board to make sure that um, those studies um, are being done with the appropriate oversight here at CSU. And I guess the final thing that I'll mention that's very, very important for us is um, that we always make sure that we um, obtain what's called informed consent from um, the owners of, of animals who are participating in these studies. So this is never done secretly. Owners are always aware that their animals are participating in a, in a clinical trial. We always try very, very hard to make sure that owners are presented with all of the treatment options that include both what we would call quote unquote standard of care. So, hey, if we didn't have a study that was going on, here are the things that we would generally offer you for the treatment of your pet with this kind of cancer. 
But as an alternative, or maybe in addition to those things, depending on the circumstance, here's a study that we have going on. Um, we talk about the pros and cons of the study and how many visits it'll require and all those kinds of things like that. And then it certainly give the owner an, an ample opportunity to make an informed decision about whether that's something that they're interested in pursuing. So that concept of informed consent is something that uh, you've probably heard about uh, in human clinical trials. And it obviously uh, applies um, very robustly to, to our clients as well. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Weissar, uh, do you want to maybe comment a little bit about um, recruitment and enrollment, how it might differ between studies and how we go about recruiting for these different trials besides just the cases that come in through the door? Sure. So obviously recruitment of patients is a, is a really big aspect of what we do. Um, it's, you know, the way that we get patients enrolled into clinical trials. And one of the biggest hurdles that we honestly have to overcome is awareness. I would say, you know, the majority of people that uh, whose pets are diagnosed with cancer, a lot of people don't even know that there are treatments available for pets with cancer. And I would say only a small portion are aware that there might be a clinical trials option. So getting the word out about clinical trials for, for pets with cancer is really a big part of what we do. Um, and there's a number of ways that we do this. So um, all of our oncology clinical trials are listed on our website, on the FACC website. We have a clinical trials page that gives a little bit of information about what clinical trials entail, and then also a page with all of our currently ongoing trials with a little bit of information about each of them. Um, the American Veterinary Medical Association also has a online searchable database of clinical trials on their website. Uh, so anybody anywhere in the country or the world honestly can go on the website and do a search for their pet specific, specific type of cancer as well as location to see if there's any clinical trials close to them. We also do a lot of research, or sorry, a lot of outreach with um, veterinarians in the area as well as local oncologists so that they're aware of the clinical trials that we have available. Um, as Dr. Lana mentioned, a, a good number of patients that we enroll into clinical trials just come in as appointments through the main oncology service that are coming in just for their diagnosis of cancer. And like Dr. Tham said, we'll go through all the standard options of treatment, but then also we'll review the records and see if we think the pet might be a good candidate for one of the clinical trials. And if so, then one of our clinical trials doctors will review the study with the owners, go over all the information, let them know exactly what's involved in the study, and let them make their decision about whether or not they're gonna enroll their patients. We also do get a good number of people reaching out to us um, about potential trials for their pets, um, whether they found out information from our website or from their regular veterinarian. And so they'll contact us to see if there might be a clinical trial option for their pet with cancer. And if there is, we can often see the patient in directly through clinical trials. Um, we can get them in a little bit sooner than through the main service and also expedite their care since we know that they're there for a clinical trial. So there's a number of different ways that we kind of do our recruitment, but it's definitely a, a really big part of what we do um, and spend a lot of time, you know, sort of educating owners and giving information about what clinical trials are and exactly what would be involved if, if their pet is enrolled. Um, like Dr. Tham said, we have everybody sign an informed consent that goes over all the information about what is actually involved in the clinical trial, what their responsibilities will be, and kind of gives them all the potential side effects and acknowledges the fact that their pet may not have any benefit from the treatment. And those are all important things that, that owners need to understand. Um, also, each trial has its own specific inclusion and exclusion criteria, so basically a list of things that the pet has to have in order to be eligible for the study, and then a list of things that would disqualify the pet for the study, and they have to meet all of those criteria in order to be eligible for the study. So we have to go through those things very carefully and make sure that we get all those boxes checked and have all that information in place. Great. Um, Dr. Burton, uh, Dr. Tham alluded to the fact that you're on the clinical review board. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about um, how do we know that the trials are safe for our patients and, and what that process is, is about? Yeah, so um, as part of the clinical trials review board, um, the principal investigator that submits the information to hopefully get a study approved includes a lot of detail about the rationale behind the study. Um, what their goals are, what the study endpoints are, what their patient population of interest is, 
Um, and then probably the, one of the most important things that we do on that is evaluate the informed consent document that they've written that um, will eventually be given to owners um, that owners will sign to say that they, they do want to participate in the study. So I think a really important role that, that we take on is reviewing that document, comparing it to the information that they've given us about how the study is um, planned to proceed and all the blood draws or biopsy or chest x-rays or MRIs that may happen as part of the study. Is there sedation that's gonna be needed? Is there anesthesia? And just make sure that all those things are very clearly reflected in the informed consent document. And um, you know, as, as somebody that's written a lot of in informed consent documents, um, I think it's very easy for us that have the whole plan of the study in our head and we think it's all very clear on paper and it's so great to have um, extra sets of eyes on these documents who don't really know what we're working on um, specifically, but can, can kind of evaluate the information that we're giving them to, to find those errors or gaps that we may not have communicated well. Um, and so that's a really important process. Um, I'm trying to think if there are other things that, um, I think the other important language that is always included in the in informed consent documents is that um, that owners can withdraw their pet at any time without penalty. And, and you don't have to tell us a reason and it's not gonna impact your future care at the cancer center. Um, sometimes a study seems like it's gonna be a really good fit and, and you and you think your dog is really excited about it and maybe sometimes it turns out that your dog isn't excited about it as you are and, and so maybe that's just not a great match. And, and I think it's important for owners to understand that just because they've enrolled their pet and their plan is to follow through with these steps, if it doesn't turn out to be a, a good fit or the right fit for their pet, then um, the ability to withdraw from the study is I think a really important piece of that to maintaining patient safety and, and patient well-being. Great, I, I think another important thing about the clinical review board is they're independent from the investigator and yep. from the sponsor. And so they're kind of someone who's looking at things objectively and, and making sure that all of the um, safety uh, parameters are, are monitored and things. And it's been a really nice uh, addition to the other institutional um, uh, animal care and use committee group that monitors trials as well. That's a great point, thank you. Yeah. Um, one, and maybe this is a good question for you, Doug, um, what's kind of the timeline of a study from maybe an idea that might, someone might have if I had an idea for a study and I wanted to move forward, how long does it take till um, we get information that might change how we operate in the clinic? Oh boy. Um, Sorry. So it, it depends a little bit on where we're starting from. So in some, in some cases, again, we might have somebody who comes to us with a, a new drug. Hey, and we've you know, given this, we've tested this drug in a whole bunch of human cancer cells and it looks like it works great and we gave it to some mice and looks like their tumors got better and we want you to try it in some dogs. And I think a lot of times we need to sort of take a step back and say, well, whoa, do, do you know that this drug works the same way in dog cells as it does in people cells? Well, maybe we need to do that first. And hey, if this is you know, one of those targeted therapies um, you know, that, that targets a very specific protein, for example, in the cell, well, what kind of dog cancers have that protein? Like, are, do, do we know the right kind of cancer to treat? Um, so, so sometimes, again, if we have to start from, from really, really square one and sort of do that very basic laboratory work to make sure that we're not barking up the wrong tree, you know, that in and of itself could be a sort of six to 12 month um, um, starting ordeal before we even think about um, starting a dog study. Um, f if we have somebody who sort of comes in, who sort of has crossed all those, uh, all those T's and dotted all those I's already, and we really sort of feel, all right, I think we can probably get a study started here. Um, I'd say probably from, uh, we're looking at usually a month or two of, again, kicking, kicking back and forth that little outline document and working through sort of contractual things. It's generally another couple of months um, to get the paperwork done and again the approval from things like the clinical review board. So maybe you know four to six months total before we're ready to actually start a study in patients. Um, the amount of time it takes to do the study depends on a whole lot of factors. Well what kind of cancer are we trying to treat and is this a cancer that we see every day or is it one of those sort of less common cancers? 
um, are we the only site in the country that's doing this study, or are there a whole bunch of other sites that are doing it at the same time? Um, so, so it's really, really hard to say, well, how long is it going to take to get this study done without knowing all those little individual bits? In some cases, it could be a few months. Some studies that we've done have taken years and years to actually complete. Um, so again, very, very variable there. And then once we sort of take a look at that information, sometimes, again, the results of a single study like that, depending on how it's designed and what its goals are, might be enough for us to be able to say, hey, we think we, we learned something that's really important. You know, we, we did a new study with a drug that's already out there that looks like it works, and maybe we should be giving it in a different way or giving it in conjunction with this other drug or using it for this other kind of tumor that we never thought of before. So sometimes just that may be enough to say, hey, we learned something really important here, and we can disseminate that information out to veterinarians, and maybe they can do it too. Um, if we're actually looking at a new drug, this is a drug that isn't approved for anything else, it hasn't been around before, then you're talking about, again, typically many additional years after you get that initial look that says, hey, maybe, maybe there's something here that looks encouraging before you'd actually have a product that's available, you know, conservatively another five to seven years of additional work, again, to make sure it's safe, to make sure you know how to manufacture it, to make sure that the, the initial studies that, that we've done that make it look like, yeah, this could be useful, that those pan out when you um, sort of repeat that with other animals in other parts of the country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, just to, again to summarize it again, some, ki some cases, if we design the study right, um, and we're using things that are already available, we may have some very, very actionable information quickly. Um, in some cases, if it's a new thing, it could be years and years and years before we really have results that are, um, that are actionable. Great, thank you. Um, and the final thing I was gonna ask each of you is to maybe comment on a, a trial that you've either been involved in or are participating in now or um, something that you feel uh, either was your favorite trial or was a, a significant contribution either to human medicine or veterinary medicine. And I guess, Dr. Burton, are you okay to go first? Uh, sure, sure. Um, I think one study, um, comparative oncology study that uh, was really exciting for me was a, a study that we worked on several years ago now, and it was a study that was conducted through our Comparative Oncology Trials Consortium, which is just a, it's a group of um, most of the vet schools in the country that um, conduct clinical trials, and it's a mechanism that, uh, that we have to conduct these bigger multi-center trials. But this study was looking at um, three new chemotherapy drugs that were all in the same class of drugs but slightly different. Um, and so the study in dogs um, was conducted to get um, a little bit more information about um, pharmacokinetics, so how, how the drug is processed in the body, and then pharmacodynamics, so what does the drug do to the tumor um, or the normal tissues, um, and then hopefully also get some preliminary um, efficacy signals. And um, the dog study was being conducted in parallel with two human phase one studies. Um, and so based on their, the data from their mouse models, two of the drugs look more promising of the three. And so they started um, the two drugs in early studies in people in parallel to this dog trial. But they didn't want to give up on that third drug yet, so they included that in the dog trial. And um, it was a trial that involved, I think it was seven or eight vet schools and ultimately about um, over 80 dogs were enrolled um, and at the end of the day we found that um, we got some great information that really informed the the drug development process um, for all three drugs um, but excitingly the third drug that probably wasn't going to get moved along the the development pipeline based on the the early data um, showed much better um, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic um, parameters in the dogs than what they'd seen in the mice. And so the drug accumulated in much higher levels in the tumor um, and had a better um, drug distribution profile. And so ultimately, based on the data um, with our dogs with lymphoma, they elected to move that third drug into a phase one study in people. So I think for me, that was a great example of um, 
how no model is perfect and we can get different information from our models. And um, you know, if any of these drugs fail in people, then um, they, it, it may come back to us in a different way that, that could help dogs in the future. Great. How about you, Kristen? So I think the study that um, really, you know, kind of hit home with me was a study that we did um, in dogs with bone cancer that Dr. Burton talked about earlier, um, that it actually had cancer spread to their lungs. So um, bone cancer in dogs as well as in people is a very aggressive tumor. Um, the, you know, we do amputation to remove the primary tumor and then follow with chemotherapy, but, you know, in, in the long run, these pets end up passing away because of spread or metastasis of the, of the tumor to their lungs. And, you know, we give them chemotherapy to try to prevent or delay the development of metastasis, but once they develop that spread to their lungs, there really aren't any treatments that, that we've found to be effective um, in this state. And so um, we did this clinical trial that was using a combination of two drugs. Um, one of them is called Palladia, which is a targeted therapy. It was actually the first anti-cancer drug approved for use in dogs. It was approved several years ago um, for dogs with the type of skin tumor, actually called mast cell tumors. But we found that this drug has um, benefits and effects in, in multiple different types of cancer in dogs. So using that in combination with a drug called Losartan, which is actually a blood pressure medication that's used in people as well as dogs. And what they found was in the lab, they found that the Losartan actually caused some changes to um, the cells surrounding the tumor, a type, specifically type of tumor called tumor, or type of cell called tumor associated macrophages. And so what they found was when they used these drugs in combination, it had sort of a synergistic effect on, on the metastatic osteosarcoma cells. So we did a clinical trial looking at dogs that had spread of cancer to their lungs using these two drugs. And the effects that we saw were actually pretty amazing. We saw dogs that had shrinkage and even disappearance of their tumors. And so we were obviously really excited about this, what we had found. And it's something that we use as you know, sort of a standard treatment for pets in, in the cancer clinic now. What's really interesting about this is that this caught the attention of some um, human pediatric oncologists down at Children's Hospital in Denver. So um, like Dr. Burton mentioned, osteosarcoma is more common in, in children and adolescents. And again, when they develop metastatic disease, uh, it's, it's not a great prognosis. They don't have a lot of great treatment options. And so they saw this information that we had generated from our clinical trials and said, hey, maybe this is something that we should try in our patients. And that, so there's actually a clinical trial going on now at Children's Hospital in Denver looking at a drug similar to Palladia, a human medication, along with uh, the Losartan treatment. And so we're really excited to see what the results of that study are. That's very cool. Um, how about you, Doug? Do you have a favorite? Sure. So um, <laughs> there's so many, <laughs> and this uh, and this just gets back to the idea about how long sometimes this process can take. So, starting back in 2006, 2007, uh, my colleague David Vale and I were approached by a, a large pharmaceutical company to look at a drug that um, that might be useful for treating things like lymphoma and leukemia. And unfortunately, or fortunately for us, unfortunately for the drug company. This particular drug, they couldn't give it to rodents, so they couldn't study it in rat, rats or mice or anything else like that because the drug sort of fell apart in, in the blood of, of those animals and they needed to find a different animal to study it in for effectiveness. And it uh, turns out that the guy that we were working with from the company was a veterinary pathologist and he said, well, wait, you know, do dogs get cancer. Maybe we could actually study this drug in dogs. And um, this was a drug that's actually specific for the treatment of lymphoma. And again, we were initially involved trying to sort of figure out, well, all right, does this in fact work for any dogs with lymphoma? And um, there's all different kinds of ways we can give it. We can give it once a week or twice a week or once every three weeks. You know, which one seems like it works the best and what sorts of things should we watch for um, to, to make sure it's tolerated and things like that. And over the course of a couple of years, we actually generated quite a lot of information about sort of how this drug works and safety and effectiveness and things like that that led to um, studies in, in humans with cancer. But uh, for reasons that we're not entirely clear on, the company eventually decided, I, I don't think we're going to continue to look at this as a human therapeutic. Um, and uh, we, meaning the veterinary community, actually had an opportunity to take that drug back. So we went back to the company and said, well, if you guys aren't going to use it, can we have it? Um, could we actually use this as a dog drug? Um, and probably starting 
in 2012 or so, maybe nine years ago or so, we actually began that process where, hey, we saw this really encouraging initial stuff. Let's, let's see if we can actually turn this into a dog drug. And that started a nine year process um, of how to make it, how to make sure that it's safe. And again, real demonstration of effectiveness that's actually, um, that led to what's called conditional approval of that drug for the treatment of dog lymphoma about four years ago by the Food and Drug Administration. And uh, we're quite hopeful that uh, this year, so calendar year 2021, that uh, drug will have full approval um, from the Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of canine lymphoma. So that will make it the first um, approved treatment for dogs with lymphoma. Um, it's a drug called Tenovia. Um, and again, it all started asking a research question and trying to help out a human pharmaceutical company with a drug. And it's turned out being maybe not a great people drug, but you know, a very useful dog drug for us. Yeah, I saw a patient today who was supposed to get Tenovia. So it's, it is pretty exciting for us when we get um, new treatments that we can uh, use in, uh, for our patients right away. Um, so we're gonna turn now to the question and answer um, portion and we'll go through the questions that were um, uh, submitted in advance. So we may or may not get through all of the questions, but um, we'll do our best. Um, I think I'll start with the one uh, for uh, Dr. Weissar. How has the pandemic affected how clinical trials are conducted? Um, this question, this individual uh, works in human clinical trials and um, know that they've had to adjust things with virtual visits and drug shipping and all sorts of things. Um, do we, have we had similar issues with our clinical trials during the pandemic? Thank you for that question. That's a great question. Um, yes, the, the pandemic has significantly affected our clinical trials program. Um, so basically kind of when the shutdown happened last March, we had to close enrollment into all of our clinical trials, put everything on hold. Um, we were still continuing to see patients in the clinic, but only ones that were coming in specifically for treatment. If there were patients that were basically scheduled for monitoring visits for the trials, we kind of delayed those and just, you know, basically checked in with owners to see how their pets were doing. Um, so definitely put a hold on things there. We weren't enrolling any new patients into trials. Um, back at sort of the end of May, we were able to open up uh, some of our clinical trials, about half of them for enrollment. Um, and again, not doing any sort of virtual visits. We were actually having patients come into the clinic, um, but our whole hospital has sort of changed to a curbside medicine sort of um, work. So no clients are allowed into the hospitals. Basically our technicians all go out and just talk to the owners at their cars and then bring the pets back in. Um, and so we've slowly started to kind of ramp things up again. Um, at this point, we have all of our clinical trials available. We started some new clinical trials since the pandemic. And so we're kind of, you know, getting back to where we were, but certainly our, our numbers aren't quite where they were prior to the pandemic. We're probably seeing about two thirds of the cases that we were prior to everything when it started in March. So um, slowly coming back up, but it's definitely affected our ability to, to enroll patients into trials and to treat them effectively. Um, our next question, um, maybe Dr. Burton, you can take this one. Uh, some people believe that entering a dog or a cat into a clinical trial and putting them at risk of receiving placebo is unethical. Can you tell us how scientists deal with this dilemma when designing clinical trials? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and certainly use of a placebo can be um, a deal breaker for, for some clients in a therapeutic trial. Um, in, in our world, the reality is, is that we have very few clinical trials that actually involve a placebo. So a lot of our trials are earlier phase studies um, and we have fewer kind of what we would consider the phase three randomized blinded controlled studies that would be more likely to have the potential for a placebo. That being said, when we do have studies that um, have a placebo, often it's combined with um, standard of care for whatever, whatever standard of care is known for that tumor type. And often the additional, the, the therapy that's being studied is often an add-on to standard of care or slightly different from standard of care. Um, and so usually these patients are getting active treatment um, as well. They just may or may not be receiving the new drug. Um, 
but I think communication of, of use of placebo is really important, and that's where the informed consent document comes in. That should be clearly outlined um, and what the likelihood is. Um, sometimes some studies will have one dog on a placebo for every two dogs on an active drug. So what, what are my odds, or is it 50-50? Um, but sometimes use of a placebo is unavoidable. Um, and I would say the one study I can think of right now is a large cancer preventative vaccine study that Dr. Tham's leaving, leading, where um, some dogs are getting a placebo vaccine, um, but there is no standard of care for prevention of cancer at this time. So these, these dogs are getting what we would consider regular care. Um, and other dogs that aren't getting the placebo vaccine are hopefully getting um, this cancer preventative vaccine. Are there other placebo trials that you have going on well, right we, now? Well, not right now. I mean, we did just finish the big trial to gain full FDA approval for the drug Tenovia that mm -hmm. Dr. Tham just mentioned. And um, like you mentioned for that study, the enrollment was three to one. So for every four patients, three of them were, were assigned to the active drug and one to placebo. But I think the other really important thing when you have a placebo controlled trial is to be able to catch those dogs that or, or cats, whatever it is, that um, are on the placebo, even though you don't know they're on the placebo, and monitor those patients really closely so that if their disease progresses, you can pull them off the study right away. So even if they are assigned to the placebo, if their disease isn't responding or getting worse, then they, they immediately come off the trial. We don't keep them on the study if they're not doing well. So I think that's an important thing to have. Yeah, that's a really good point. And there have been some other studies that have used a placebo, and in the same way, when they find that the dog's cancer is progressive, then actually those, those dogs have been able to, to then get the active drug. Right. So that's another way that sometimes it's managed. Yep. Yeah. Great. Um, question about hemangiosarcoma. Um, how close are we to prevention, to effective treatment, or to a cure? What's new for hemangio? You want this one, Doug? Sure. So, <laughs> thanks for that question. So that's a really tough cancer to treat, and uh, it's not for one of trying. But uh, uh, there are some pretty exciting things that are going on right now that we don't know for certain whether they're effective or not. Um, so there's a couple of different groups that are actually looking at um, either ways to, uh, for early detection or monitoring of dogs with hemangiosarcoma. So there's a group at, uh, at Minnesota um, that's looking in the blood um, at certain blood cells that may be indicative of hemangiosarcoma. Um, there's another group that's actually working on an antibody test, an antibody screening test that might be useful for early detection of hemangiosarcoma. So can you catch it before it spreads, et cetera, et cetera, to potentially improve the prognosis. And then there are a few um, um, studies that are looking at novel treatments. So um, the, the drug that Kristen mentioned previously, Losartan, this uh, blood pressure medication that, that we've had some success with for treating osteosarcoma, is also being actually looked at in conjunction with conventional chemotherapy for the treatment of hemangiosarcoma. There's another um, um, heart-related drug called propranolol, uh, which is a beta blocker that's also being looked at in separate studies in conjunction with chemotherapy for dogs with hemangiosarcoma. So the results of both of those are eagerly awaited, but we don't have any information yet. And actually the, the, the vaccine trial that, uh, that Dr. Burton mentioned that we're involved with trying to prevent cancer, um, one of the kinds of cancer that's being targeted by that vaccine is hemangiosarcoma. So if in fact at the end of the day, many years from now, that study, the results of that study do suggest um, that there's a positive benefit, one of the tumor types that could be reduced or eliminated in, in those animals that are vaccinated would be hemangiosarcoma. So again, we're very hopeful about that, but again, we need quite a bit more time before we're able to make any conclusions. Um, another question, uh, do you, and this can be for anyone, um, do you share the database information obtained through clinical trials with other institutions? Is there a repository where others can learn, um, come to their own conclusions or combine um, data that's generated with other data to help move things forward. So I can uh, I can take a crack at that. So actually, that's a, a there's a brand new initiative, uh, actually across the United States called the Integrated Canine Data Commons, IDCD, IDCDC, <laughs> yeah. which is actually um, seeking to do exactly that. So take information that's generated from from clinical trials in dogs with cancer across the country. So clinical information, so what kind of cancer did they have, what did they get treated with, how'd they do, 
um, laboratory results. So hey, how did their blood look after they got treated? Um, genomic evaluation of the tumors. So hey, did we sequence the DNA in that tumor and what did it have? Gene expression information, pathology information, and put all of that information into a gigantic database um, specifically so that um, other investigators can actually take a look at that information and potentially use that as a jumping off point for future studies. So that's a work in progress, but uh, we're actually working very hard. And actually, Dr. Don Duval, who's uh, one of our, our basic scientists at the Flint Animal Cancer Center, is serving on that committee and helping to design that, that data common so that it's useful for everybody in the scientific community. And I, I know I just popped on their website the other day. They're also including imaging data, like oh, yeah. um, results of MRIs, to be able to combine that with the genetic data that you might get from sequencing a brain tumor, and then the clinical outcome data and the treatment data. So once it um, becomes more robust, it's going to be a really um, interesting and I think very useful um, data commons. And that's. Um, housed in the National Cancer Institute. So it's, it's a really nice step forward. Um, another question we have is, do you have ongoing trials for all cancer types? And um, a sub-question is, what breeds in particular are more prone to cancer? You want me to take that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, we don't have clinical trials available for every type of cancer. Um, most of the time, our, our trials are, are geared more towards the common types of cancer that we see in pets, so things like lymphoma, bone cancer, soft tissue sarcomas, and other skin tumors. And that's because we want to be able to recruit patients to these studies. So if we have a clinical trial for a really rare type of cancer, it's going to take us a really long time to enroll patients and to accrue that data. And also, we want a trial to be able to provide the most benefit for the most patients. So obviously, something that we see commonly, we're going to be able to get that information more quickly and help a good number of patients. Um, every now and then, we have trials for more rare cancers, but that's definitely not common. Um, there are certainly are breeds that are known to pre be predisposed to cancer and sometimes certain types of cancers. So for example, we know that Bernese mountain dogs are predisposed to a type of cancer called histiocytic sarcoma. Um, there are certainly a lot of other breed predispositions and, and breeds that are predisposed. I know for um, Dr. Tham's vaccination study, um, there are sort of breeds that they're geared towards just because those have the highest risks of cancer. Do you want to list off some of your yeah, so, so for the study that we have ongoing, we're specifically selecting both mixed breed dogs and then breeds that are, um, have a higher than average risk of death due to cancer. And some of the breeds that are included there include uh, Bernese Mountain Dogs, Boxers, Golden Retrievers, um, Scottish Terriers, which have a very high likelihood of developing one particular kind of cancer called bladder cancer, uh, Labradors, German Shepherds, Huskies, what am I missing, Cocker Spaniels. Uh, standard poodles, so um, the list goes on and on. So um, the interesting thing is that some of them sort of seem to be sort of generically at an increased risk for cancer, but then there are some very profound um, sort of risks for very specific kinds of tumors in certain breeds of dogs. So for example, hate to say it, Dr. Weissar, boxers actually have very <laughs> high incidence of certain kinds of brain cancer and a very high incidence of mast cell tumors, for example. And again, Scottish Terriers have this astronomical incidence of, of bladder cancer. And actually, that's you know, very, very unfortunate for those particular breeds of animal. But because um, of those, that selective breeding that's taken place over hundreds and hundreds of years, um, it actually is a very interesting genetic question to ask. And, and folks are, are very actively asking those kinds of questions. So what are the genes that these particular breeds of dogs have that make them so sensitive or so, so predisposed to these very specific kinds of cancer? And again, can we learn things about those genes that can inform preventative strategies, selective breeding approaches, and potentially um, learning new things that might be applicable to human cancers um, as well? Awesome. Um, the final question that I have was, uh, I think we've already talked about it quite a bit, is, um, knowing more about trials that move from the lab to people. Um, we talked about the Losartan clinical trial with osteosarcoma metastasis. Um, are there any other uh, examples that you have off the top of your head? Uh, the other example that comes to mind for me is a study that we did, again, with a, with a small pharmaceutical company from the Bay Area. 
um, using a drug um, that actually is now called ibrutinib. So this is, a, again, a targeted therapy that works by interfering with signaling through um, B cells, which are, again, a kind of white blood cell, and this is a kind of white blood cell that can turn into lymphoma. And um, again, we were approached by the company to actually do some, some work, um, primarily um, to, to look at a test that they wanted to use in their subsequent human trials to make sure that this test was going to be appropriate and it was going to answer the questions that they wanted to answer. But in addition to sort of being able to say, yep, this test looks like it's going to be a good test, we actually saw um, several dogs in the study who actually had meaningful improvement in their cancer when treated with this drug. And this was before any studies were performed in people. And I really think that the, the fact that we were able to show that there was some anti-tumor activity with this compound um, in a way that was very, very safe actually accelerated the, uh, the movement of that drug into human clinical trials. And that's actually a drug that's now approved for the treatment of, of humans with lymphoma called Imbruvica. It's uh, uh, a drug that, that earns you know, multi-billion dollars in sales every year for the treatment of human cancer. And, you know, I'd like to think that the, that little bit of work that we did in, in dogs with lymphoma really sort of gave them a nudge at just the right time to sort of move that drug forward into human studies. Me too. Awesome. <laughs> um, that's all of our submitted questions, and we're running low on time. Yeah, we're right, right at that one, one uh, hour mark. I we know. are. We have just a couple minutes. We did get a few questions. They're very short, so I'm okay. going to pose them to you guys real quick. Um, similar to the question about the dog database that Dr. Tham talked about, are you constantly looking at human clinical tri trials and their outcomes, contacting their sponsors, and seeing if the treatment can be used on our pups? I think we, I mean, I think we always keep a close eye on what they're doing in the human world as far as oncology and, you know, if there's something that um, you know, we're able to, to learn from their trials and apply to our patients, we're more than happy to do so. Um, you know, a lot of the, the therapies that they're looking at now in, in humans are more targeted therapies, and um, those can be a little bit difficult to use in, in our patients just because um, the, the drugs that target the receptors on human cancer cells don't always work on the canine and feline cancer cells. Um, and also it can be sometimes difficult for pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies to give those medications to us to use in veterinary patients when they're using them in humans. So it's definitely something that we always keep an eye out for. And, you know, sometimes we can get information from them that we can then translate to our patients. Okay, and we will end on one last question. Is there a cost to the pet parent in the clinical trial? Who wants that one? <laughs> sure. <answer> <laughs> um, that is really dependent on the trial. And so um, I think kind of a general rule of thumb is um, if it is a, a drug that is truly novel, and this is maybe the first time that it's being given to dogs or cats in a clinical trial, um, those studies often come um, are associated with maybe um, a few more blood draws or maybe an extra tumor biopsy or that sort of thing. Those trials uh, tend to be fairly uh, well incentivized with most of the visits paid for and all costs associated with the treatment and sometimes even come with a, an additional incentive to a client that they can, um, like a credit to their hospital account that then can be used additional, towards additional treatment once their pet is off the clinical trial. Um, if it is a trial where it's more of um, kind of a known effective drug, a standard of care, um, so some of these later trials with Tenovia, um, the drug may have been provided um, at no cost, but the other things that are associated with patient care, like the visit, the complete blood count, or the administration of the drug, those um, may have been at a cost to the owner. So it's highly variable, and that's another important part of our communication piece um, with the owners when we're discussing these clinical trials and whether one might be the right step for them and their pet. So I, I think we are um, reached our uh 2.30 mark, and so we'll go ahead and, and wrap things up. I want to thank our panelists for participating today. Um, it's a great discussion, and I want to thank everyone um, for logging on. And if there's additional questions that come in, we'll do our best to answer those um, uh, 
by communication with email. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.